Thank you for joining me as I continue my examination of the book The Magic Man in the Sky by Carl Gallops from My Atheist Perspective. In this video, I'm going to cover chapters 18 and 19 of the book. So let's get started right away with chapter 18, which is titled Pondering Pesky Puzzles. I adore alliteration. When we last saw Carl Gallops, he was about to reveal to us the unanswered questions, the deep conundrums that render evolutionary theory useless as a scientific explanation. What are those deep conundrums? Gallops hits us with the first one on the first page of the chapter, and it is a golden oldie. Quote, Scientists now understand that the universe in which we live is comparable to a precision-designed instrument of unimaginable magnitude. In fact, the universe appears tweaked to a point of absolute precision for the sole purpose of enabling life on Earth. The scope of the universe's fine-tuning makes the anthropic principle perhaps one of the most powerful arguments for the existence of an intelligent designer. Yes, the argument from design, or as Gallops calls it, the anthropic principle. He goes on to define the anthropic principle as that, quote, fancy title that expresses the burgeoning evidence that has a number of modern scientists believing the universe is finely tuned, designed for the specific purpose of supporting human life. But in fact, a very, very small number of modern scientists. Gallup's gives the impression that the anthropic principle is this hot new idea when in fact it is an archaic and all but discarded idea. The modern scientific consensus is not that the universe is fine-tuned to our specific needs. The more we learn about the universe, the more conceited and preposterous that suggestion sounds. Gallops tries to run through the usual evidence for the fine-tuned universe, but he screws it up. Usually people who make this argument insist that life couldn't exist if any of the dozens and dozens of fundamental physical constants, and these are things like the speed of light in a vacuum, the gravitational constant, the various electromagnetic constants, the strength of the, the strong and weak nuclear forces, uh, if these had values other than what they actually have. And they point out these supposedly astronomical odds of the values of the constants just so happening to be what they are to allow for the existence of our universe and ourselves. If the universe was not intentionally tuned to its present state, so the argument goes, then we essentially have to accept that we just won the cosmic lottery. and We just happened to luck into a universe that is perfectly tuned to fit our, our needs. Well, this is a bad argument, even when it is properly made, because one, we don't know what other possible values there are for the constants, or even if other values are possible, which makes any calculation of odds utterly meaningless. Two, we don't know how many other universes there are, possible with con possibly with constants different from our own, uh, and if enough people are playing, somebody has to win the lottery eventually. Uh, three, the argument is essentially pointing out that the things which the laws of physics of this universe allow to exist are the things that exist in this universe, which is not evidence of anything extraordinary and is in fact exactly what we would expect to find. The things that exist in this universe are the things which the conditions of this universe allow to exist. It's pitched as though it's some mind-blowing revelation, but if you think about it, it's exactly what we would expect. If we saw something other than that, then that would be an incredible shock and a deep, profound mystery. But what we see now, nothing mysterious about it at all. Exactly what we would expect to see. And four, even if the universe was fine-tuned to its current state, it's still rather presumptuous of us to assume the fine-tuning was for our benefit. Maybe the grand designer just really likes quasars and regards us as an unremarkable byproduct. But all of that is beside the point, because that refutation is directed at the fine-tuning argument as properly made. And as I said before, Gallops screws up the argument. He mentions the anthropic principle, he mentions the fine-tuning of the universe, but when he goes into details about what those fine-tuned constants are, he says this, 
quote, These constants include such things as our exacting distance from the sun, the meticulous balance of gravitational forces, the Earth's axis rotation rate, and the thickness of the Earth's crust. They also include the preciseness of atmospheric discharge, the delicate balance of the thickness of our protective and life-sustaining atmosphere, and the interaction of the salt and freshwater bodies. In addition, the list includes the necessity of specific types of vegetation, the precise chemical balances of the air we breathe, and the absolute necessity of the interconnectivity of our ecology from honeybees to rainforests. If we generously interpret the meticulous balance of gravitational forces to be a reference to the gravitational constant, then that makes one actual fundamental physical constant named in that quote. The other things, the Earth's distance from the Sun, the Earth's rate of rotation, the thicknesses of Earth's crust and atmosphere, etc., may be very important, even essential, to the existence of life on Earth and to Earth having its present condition. But they are not only not physical constants, they are not constants in any sense. The value of all of those things have fluctuated in the past and will continue to change from time to time in the future. They are not constants and they are certainly not universal. It was bad enough when Gallup's was using old bad arguments. Now he's using old bad arguments he doesn't even understand. Gallup's builds on his botched fine-tuning argument by returning to something he said in a previous chapter that perhaps the greatest evidence for the fine-tuning of the universe is the fact that we appear to have the whole place to ourselves. And if Earth is the only place in the universe that supports life, what does that mean? Does it mean the universe was made just for us? Well, Gallops thinks so. He sees further evidence for this in the arrangement of life here on Earth. He says, quote, What if all the animals were removed, or if all the insects were gone, or if all the plant life disappeared? we would eventually die. Now think about this. What if humans, and only humans, were removed from the planet? Everything would continue. The ecology is perfect. The system would sustain itself without us. The evidence would appear, then, that humans are not here for the Earth, but the Earth is here for humans, and humans alone. Now look at what he's doing here. He contrasts the removal of humans from the ecosystem with the removal of all other animals or all plants or all insects and he says see they could survive without us but we couldn't survive without them so they must be here for us this may be the most narcissistic line of reasoning he's presented in this entire book as well as the most blatantly flawed of course life would go on if humans were removed from the ecosystem and of course humans could not survive very long if a major portion of the ecosystem like say all the animals or all the plants were removed that doesn't point to the conclusion that Earth is here for humans and humans alone. You could make the exact same argument and get an identical result if you swapped out humans for another species. Like, for instance, this. Take away all the plants, and eventually, Formosan termites will die. But take away Formosan termites, and everything else will continue. It would appear, then, that Formosan termites are not here for the Earth, but the Earth is here for Formosan termites. See how asinine that sounds? If a termite said that shit to you, you would laugh in its face. Gallops again insists that we are alone in the universe, which, as I've said previously in this series, seems to give this argument a limited shelf life, considering how increasingly inevitable the discovery of extraterrestrial life in some form seems. Then, before he moves on to the next deep conundrum, he reveals the real reason that he finds the anthropic principle so compelling, and surprise, surprise, it has nothing to do with evidence. Quote, The reality is that we live on a unique planet. We are perfectly positioned in an extraordinary solar system that is ideally located in an enormous and rare galaxy that exists within a remarkable and implausible universe. Yet the message of the Bible alone implies that we are indeed the crowning glory of the universe. We 
are the center of God's heart. We are the ones for whom God sent his son to die for our sins. We are the ones to whom God reaches out his hand of forgiveness and reconciliation. Our life does have purpose, value, and meaning. The anthropic principle must be valid because it means we're special! We're special, we're special, we're special! It means the world really does revolve around us! Told you, science! I would argue with his assessment of reality at the beginning of the quote. There doesn't seem to be anything unique or extraordinary about our planet or our solar system. Our galaxy certainly isn't rare, and while the universe is most definitely remarkable, we have no basis for thinking of it as implausible. In what sense could we say the universe is implausible? Well, what are we basing that on? The most extraordinary thing about our planet is that it hosts life. But again, it may only be a matter of time until we discover life on other planets, and then apologists like Gallup's are forced to finally cross this argument off their list, although maybe that's wishful thinking. The next deep conundrum that supposedly hobbles the theory of evolution is the existence of cellular respiration and the fact that living things need food. Gallup's has some thoughts on, like, how weird it is that we can live by eating other forms of life, like, quote, when we ingest other living things, the DNA of those living things, fruits, vegetables, nuts, meats, etc., just happens to be compatible with our DNA so that cellular respiration can take place. If it were not for the fact that our DNA is so akin to all other living things, we could not eat. If we could not eat, we would die. The DNA of those things we eat doesn't just happen to be compatible with our DNA. That's the result of common descent. That is not a mystery of evolution. It's something that is explained by evolution. Again, we encounter the problems that result when you try to use arguments you don't understand. Gallup's lists several more puzzling conundrums that arise from our need of food and our method of obtaining energy from that food. When, why, and how did the need to eat other things originate? All questions for which there are compelling and fascinating answers, by the way, Carl. You should Google it or maybe take a class or something. It makes you sound really foolish when you pose questions we know the answers to as unsolvable mysteries. Carl also asks, why would natural selection not have chosen a simpler or more ecology-friendly method to see to the energy needs of its organisms? If evolution is so great, why do most forms of life use this this same not terribly efficient form of cellular respiration. Well, the thing is, cellular respiration in its most basic form, which would be glycolysis, if I remember my Bio 101 correctly, evolved between three and a half and four billion years ago, and it's still here. It's found in almost all forms of life, and it is not the best, most efficient way of harvesting energy from food that we could possibly imagine, but this is consistent with natural evolution, not with an intelligent designer. Gallup's is actually pointing out how poorly designed cellular respiration is as evidence for it being designed by his omnipotent and omniscient God. He's claiming that the fact that all forms of life use the same basic method of cellular respiration is uh, evidence against evolution. This is maybe the weakest, most self-defeating argument he's yet made. Not only does evolution not raise these questions, it answers these questions. These aren't problems for the theory of evolution. They're problems solved by the theory of evolution. Again, Carl, if you're watching, audit a Bio 101 class at your local community college, man. It really helps to know slightly more than fuck all about the subject you're arguing about. The next conundrum which Gallup's presents is uh, as a problem for evolution, which is actually the exact opposite of a problem for evolution, is the uniqueness of humans. Gallup's reminds us that humans were made in God's image, and he refers to this as the technical definition of humans and that God has declared that humans are unlike anything else in creation. 
Oh sure, Gallops admits, there are some similarities between humans and apes, and he even acknowledges that genetic similarities are there between humans and chimps, but quote, a number of scientists say we share as much as 98% similarities. The genome similarity logically would explain why we look slightly alike, but that is about where the real comparisons end, though this is given as proof of an imagined evolutionary process that connects chimps and man through a mysterious yet undiscovered common ancestor. Again, he's making a gap argument. He's, he's just as he's arguing for us having the universe to ourselves because we haven't discovered extraterrestrial life, he's arguing that a common ancestor between humans and chimps doesn't exist because we haven't found it yet. That's a really bad argument. And the genetic similarities and the physical similarities between humans and chimps are given as proof that chimps and humans share common ancestors because that's what it's proof of. Sharing common ancestors is what being related means. And testing for genetic similarities is how we determine how closely related two organisms are to each other. Humans and chimps are related to each other, genetically. That's what it means that we share 94 to 98 percent of our DNA in common, which means that we share a common ancestor. That's a fact. Whether we ever positively identify that ancestor in the fossil record or not is irrelevant to the question of its existence. It must have existed. Incredibly, Gallops then goes on to describe the remarkable similarities between human DNA and the DNA of baker's yeast, only to declare at the end of this consideration that humans are very different from yeast and can do things no other life forms can do, therefore common descent is invalid. By that same logic, I suppose we could conclude that the Wright Brothers Flyer and the F-35 Stealth Fighter are in no way related, because even though they have a few similarities, the F-35 is far too advanced to have descended from something so simple. Since we humans are so much smarter and more sophisticated than even the cleverest lower animals, Gallup's figures there's only one plausible explanation. We were intelligently designed by the God of the Bible. He designed us to be superior to all other living things. Quote, without a doubt, we alone are tasked with dominion over all the earth, observably and without debate. That is the way it is, whether the evolutionists like it or not. Now, that's a nice applause line if he's giving this presentation in a church or something, good for a cheap pop. But that's the way it is, whether you like it or not, isn't something I would expect someone with a strong case based on solid evidence and compelling arguments to say. People resort to insisting that they're just right, damn it, when they've got nothing else, but they're too proud or bullheaded to admit they're wrong. This God made us better than other living things and put us in charge attitude is also precisely the sort of poisonous arrogance that has led humans to ravage the natural world and destroy countless species for our own selfish purposes. And it's also a major factor in the ongoing refusal to accept and seriously address the occurrence of climate change. So well done, Carl. The next evolution-smashing conundrum Gallops presents is the intricacy and sophistication of the human body. In other words, the argument from irreducible complexity. Gallops goes on and on and on about the body's many systems, all of which must work together in harmony for us to live. He mentions the millions and millions of cells of which we are made. He mentions how complicated our biological systems are and wonders how, when, and why these systems evolved. He pretends once again that he is posing unanswerable questions when, in fact, he could learn the basics of the scientific answers to these questions with only a small amount of study. And he says things like this, quote, when examined from a scientific standpoint, it would appear that we are created in a wonderful way. In a more logical sense, life was purposed by an intelligent designer. Creation itself declares his glory and power. 
which literally sounds like something Ray Comfort wrote. This entire book has been just saturated by ignorance, arrogance, and dishonesty, but after reading this chapter, I would really like to see Ray Comfort and Carl Gallup's side by side in the same place at the same time, just to make sure they are, in fact, different people. Well, the next supposedly unanswerable conundrum that discredits evolutionary theory is sex. As with the others, Gallops makes an argument from incredulity, asking questions like, how could sex possibly have evolved? And why did evolution result in something as complicated as sex? Aren't we fortunate that scientists didn't just stop with those questions, that they actually pursued answers to them? Anyway, uh, he says, quote, how did all of humankind originate at the same time, but with separate sexual systems fully operating, ready to work as functioning males and females? See what I mean when I say he's, he's really sounding like Ray Comfort? You know, surely not even Carl Gallup's is such a dipshit that he thinks sex originated with humans. I mean, I suppose in a way he does, because he believes we were all sort of the product of special creation. But even if he rejects evolution, surely he understands that, according to evolutionary theory, sex evolved long before humans did, in species far older and simpler than ours. The reason the first humans were able to have functioning males and females is that sexual reproduction first evolved over a billion years ago. Before the Cambrian explosion, the first sex on Earth was not had by animals, but by single-celled organisms. Again, asking questions for which there are answers is not a good tactic of argumentation. And I want to emphasize, actually, before we move on, that the origin of sex isn't something we necessarily understand well or understand comprehensively. Like the origin of life, there are lots of unanswered questions and there are lots of arguments and disagreements in the field as to what happened and how it happened and, and, and the evolutionary reasons for why it happened. But it is not the insurmountable obstacle Gallup's portrays it as. Just because we aren't yet sure which answer is the right one or what the complete comprehensive answer is doesn't mean there isn't an answer or that we don't know anything or that we must appeal to the supernatural to explain it. Gallops closes the chapter with another blast of arguments from incredulity, this time just throwing out questions with no further elaboration, questions like where did matter come from, or where did water come from, or how old is the solar system, which proves nothing. Most of the questions he asks have nothing to do with Darwinian evolution, and embarrassingly several of them have been answered fairly definitively. The solar system is around five billion years old, for example. It's not a mystery. We know the answer to that one, Carl, you ignoramus. But it's all ultimately irrelevant because before he reaches the end of the chapter, Gallup's lets slip his real reason for rejecting evolution, and as with his enthusiastic promotion of the anthropic principle, it has nothing to do with evidence. Quote, because I approach life from a distinctly biblical worldview, I do not believe that evolution is the vehicle whereby life, and in particular humankind, arrived on Earth. Well, Carl, that's all you had to say. I figured as much anyway. You believe what you believe because the Bible says so, and nothing will ever change your mind. Fine. Just call it like it is, dude, and don't waste everyone's time trying to say that the science is on your side when you don't give a fuck what the science says in the first place, okay? Moving on to the next chapter, chapter 19, but they have never heard. As you probably deduced from the chapter title, Gallops is about to respond to the challenge to Christianity that asks how a just God could condemn people to damnation who had never even heard of Jesus, the one way to salvation. Well, this is a fair challenge, Gallops acknowledges, but it is based on biblical ignorance and three important false assumptions. The first false assumption 
about how God deals with people who have never heard the gospel is that humans are ignorant of God. This is not true, Gallup says. People may not know the story of Jesus, but they know of God, and they know they are accountable to him. How do they know this? Quote, I believe that humankind knows God exists, and that we know something of his moral law because he has placed this truth in our hearts, and it binds us to him. Gallops then quotes a pair of passages from the Bible as evidence for this. So, again, because the Bible says so. The Bible says that everyone is born with an innate knowledge, not only of God's existence, but of their accountability to God for their sins. So that's that. When someone, an atheist, say, says they honestly don't think God exists, we can be sure they're lying or suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because an anonymously authored text that originated thousands of years before they were born says so. Sounds reasonable to me. The second false assumption is that people are without guilt. Nuh-uh, says Carl Gallops, people are not innocent. From the beginning, they are guilty. Quote, everyone, every person on the planet is guilty from the beginning. Thus, in reality, if no one ever heard the gospel and a person never had the chance to come to Christ, he is still condemned already. He is guilty before God and deserving of hell, or eternal death, from the start. So think about that for a second. You're guilty from the beginning, from the moment you begin to exist. Before you have a chance to do anything, say anything, think anything, feel anything, you are condemned. Any just system of morality would judge you innocent by default in that circumstance, but to God, you are guilty. Before you have even had the chance to sin, you're declared to be sinful and you will be punished for your sins even if you live your whole life and die having never even learned of your sinful condition or your one route to redemption. Think about that for a second and then ask yourself, why do people fight so hard to convince themselves and others that this is true? Why would anyone want this to be true? This awful, evil system that condemns people from the first instant of their existence for the rest of eternity, before they've even had a chance, an opportunity, to choose anything for themselves. And I know not all Christians see their faith in this way, and many would probably share my revulsion. But this is how Carl Gallops sees it, and this is what he is defending. A religion devoted to worshiping a God who finds you guilty of the crime of being alive and sentences you to everlasting punishment for it. Well, before he gets to the third false assumption, Gallops explains the role of the gospel in all of this. Since all people are doomed from the start, whether they hear the gospels or not, it makes no difference whether people hear the gospel and reject it or never hear it at all. Quote, The good news is that the gospel is going out and billions are coming up against it and having to make a decision about Jesus' claim upon their lives. A loving God is giving them a loving chance. In the grand scheme of things, God does not have to give anyone a chance. Nevertheless, he does, because he loves us and desires to redeem his creation. Those who respond to his offer of salvation, he receives. Just wait, it gets worse. Quote, Think of the love of God. He does not have to offer salvation to a single person. He did not have to send his son. He did not have to bear the burden for our sin. He does not have to offer a way for fallen humanity to be redeemed. But he does. Have you ever heard more abject, pathetic excuse-making in your life? Again, I ask you to consider the evil of the God Gallops is describing. A God who creates sentient life knowing ahead of time that almost all of it will die and suffer unimaginable anguish forever. A God 
who creates the circumstances that doom those life forms to that anguish. A God who, in the words of his perfect divine revelation, does this for his own pleasure. But, says Gallup's, think of the love of this God. After all, he didn't have to save anyone from the damnation he created. But he has chosen to save a few. The ones who prove that they will love him no matter how horribly he abuses them, that they will worship him and call him good no matter how undeserving he is, he'll save them. He doesn't have to, meaning there is no power in the universe that could force him to, and apparently no higher moral standard which he respects that could compel him to. He does because it just so happens to please him to do so. And we should be grateful for this whim of his and call it love and give him our love and devotion in return. There could be no greater evil than this, if only it were real, which thankfully it is not. But real or not, it's difficult to imagine a more pitiful and contemptible apologist for it than Carl Gallup's has become in this chapter. The third false assumption is that it's impossible for everyone to know the truth. Well, this is false, Gallup says, because the Bible contains accounts of God reaching people himself. For instance, Moses via the burning bush, or Paul via his vision on the road to Damascus. Quote, As already demonstrated, God is capable of reaching whomever he chooses, whenever and wherever he chooses. Yes, our mission is to deliver the gospel, and we will answer for our success or failure to do so. However, if a person never hears the gospel at all, that eternal matter must be left to God. I am certain he knows how to straighten out the matter. So, there you go. If you're concerned about people who haven't heard the gospel going to hell, don't worry. Just assume that God will treat them fairly. God, who invented evil, suffering, death, and hell in the first place. Just leave it to him. Oh, but be sure to keep spreading the gospel. Yeah, it sounds kind of pointless after this chapter. In fact, this whole book seems kind of pointless after this chapter. But you better do it anyway. You better keep spreading the good news. Because after all, it was an order. And you know how God, the all-loving and all-just, feels about obedience. Or should I say disobedience? You know, there's a famous passage from the book of Amos in the Old Testament that I thought of as I was reading this chapter. It goes hate the evil and love the good. This 19th chapter of The Magic Man in the Sky has shown me with blinding clarity that Christianity, as preached by the likes of Carl Gallup's, is not about hating the evil and loving the good. It's about loving the evil and calling it good. I cannot fathom a more rotten, twisted, dehumanizing, system of thought. I don't think I would want to. This is one circumstance where I'm very glad to be a person of somewhat limited imagination. Well, that is it for this video, and thankfully, especially after these last two chapters, and particularly chapter 19, that is almost it for this entire book. The next video in this series will be the final video in the Magic Man in the Sky series. I will be covering the last three chapters of this book. Chapter 20, The Sky is Falling, The Sky is Falling. Chapter 21, Requiem for a Saint, Hope for a Sinner. And Chapter 22, The Ultimate Question. And then I will be done with this horrible book. This awful piece of fucking garbage. I will be finished it. And so will you. We can have a party. We can drink beers and throw a party and, you know, eat ice cream or whatever Whatever we want to do. We'll have a pizza party to celebrate not having to read and think about this stupid book ever again. My, my sincerest condolences to any of you who have ever been given this book by uh, a well-meaning Christian relative in the hopes that it would save you. Because, ooh, I've really gone sour on it the last, <laughs> the last two chapters, if you haven't been able to tell. Um, anyway, so I'll finish it up in the next video. Thank you guys as always for watching. Please leave a comment. Let me know where you agree or disagree. Tell me what I got right. Tell me what I really fucked up and got wrong. I appreciate hearing from you no matter what you have to say. 
I'm very grateful to you that uh, this is of interest to you and of use to you. Uh, that's, that's the reason I keep doing it, even when I encounter chapters like this last one. Uh, so thank you guys so much. And I will see you in the next video to wrap up this series.